and welcome back to Stolen From Me. I'm your host, Lindsay, and this episode come with the usual listener discretion. We cover domestic violence and murder and a whole lot more on this episode. Also, all the information I have on this episode I found online through various different sources. I compiled it into one episode and then on the day of the recording, I believe it all to be true. This takes us to today's episode of Catherine Knight. Now, Catherine Knight was a twin and they were born on the 24th of October 1955 in Tamworth Hospital. Catherine and her sister Joy, their parents are Barbara and Ken. But before this happened, Barbara was in fact married to a man called Jack and they lived in New South Wales, Australia. It was a bit of a toxic relationship, but Barbara was the talk of the town. She was having an affair with Jack's work colleague and friend, Ken. In a small town where they lived, gossip spread like wildfire to the point where Barbara left Jack and ran away with Ken. She left their four children behind. She went on to start a new life with Ken and have four more children. This included Catherine and Joy. In 1959, Jack passed away, which meant the two older boys that was living with him now had to go back and live with their mum and Ken. Catherine was around 11 years old when she came forward stating that her family or someone in her family had sexually abused her and it wasn't her father. There was a couple of people in her family that actually backed her up on this and said it's true and the case actually went to court but I couldn't find anything out on the case other than it went to court. Now, Catherine's school years consisted of being bullied and loneliness. But the fact that she actually attacked another student and even assaulted a teacher with a weapon might explain why she was lonely. When Catherine was 16, she got a job at a local slaughterhouse. This made her day. It was a happy place. She was really good at her job. She worked hard and she worked her way up to the section of a job called boning. And this is what she loved doing. The job actually rewarded her with a set of her own butcher's knives, which she took home and she hung above her bed. Now, in 1973, David Keller and Catherine met. David was described as a really nice man, but drank a lot. What I found out in his defence, I think, kind of explains why he does drink a lot. And he saw his friend die in front of him. Then he witnessed a train crash that killed six children and David actually helped out at the scene clearing children's bodies up. This is where his drinking got out of hand and David actually escalated into street fighting. Although this didn't put Catherine on, off one bit, she actually joined in with the street fighting. David and Catherine finally got married in 1974 and it's believed that it was more Catherine's idea than David's and David just kind of went along with it, although he did turn up at his wedding intoxicated. Now Barbara, Catherine's mother, she had some premarital advice for David and it went like this. You better watch this one or she'll fuck you up. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't even think about playing up on her. Cheating. She'll fucking kill you. And that was the advice of her mother. She also went on to say that Catherine had a screw loose. Although this I can't actually disagree with. Now this kind of brings us to the wedding of the wedding night. So they're now getting married and then the wedding night. This is actually supposed to be their happy time. But Catherine was filled with rage. And it was kind of her mother's fault as well, but got in a sick way. Like, so what happened was David and Catherine got married. They spent the night together. They had sex three times and then David fell asleep. This didn't go well with Catherine. She went mental. And this is all because her mother said to her that she had sex five times on her wedding night and Catherine then felt not good enough. Like, why can my mum have sex five times, but I can only have sex three times? I must not be good enough. That's how she felt. 
So by doing this, she actually went on to try and strangle David. This infuriated her so badly. But the marriage, I have got to admit, it didn't get any better. And she was heavily pregnant one time. And what she did was she walked over to David. She smacked him with a frying pan and then set fire to his clothes because he was with his friends and he didn't come back in time. Now, David tried to escape Catherine a few times. He actually got assessed because he went to the hospital and got treated because he had a fractured skull. That must have been one swing from, you know, to fracture his skull. The the police actually wanted to press charges, but see, Catherine had this really good way of getting what she wants from men. She was really good at sort of wrapping them around her finger and wooing them. So this ended up being all charges dropped. Now, David did end up leaving Catherine and finding someone else. This obviously didn't go down with Catherine very well. She was not going to let this happen. I mean, if anyone's going to leave anyone, that would always be Catherine leave them. So she had her little baby and she put it in a pram and she went for a walk. Now, instead of uh, any other mum who was stressed out or angry or, you know, they would just walk it off. They'd just go for a nice walk, try and find some trees or something and, you know, calm down. Not Catherine. She viciously shook her pram with her little baby in it from side to side, swinging it so badly that someone obviously called the authorities and she was hospitalised. Later, postnatal depression was diagnosed. When Catherine was released from hospital, she didn't really get any help she needed through anything, let alone postnatal depression. But what she did do next was she went and picked up a daughter and instead of being full of sorrow and and totally devastated with the fact that she actually hurt her daughter and put her life at risk, she grabbed her daughter, placed her on a set of railway lines and then a train was due to come. Luckily, a local man saw the baby on the railway track and rescued her just in time. And it stated just in time as well. Now, Catherine was clearly not in her right mind. She then stole an axe and went on a kind of rampage trying to kill people randomly in the street. She was hospitalised again and released again. This led to more violence and including a slashing of a lady's face to holding a young lad hostage. The police actually disarmed Catherine and admitted her to a psychiatric hospital. David tried his hardest to escape Catherine, but she just wouldn't let him go. They got back together again in 1980 and they went on to have another daughter. With all the hospital stays and police being involved, it's really hard to believe that she managed to talk her way out of every single situation she was in, but that seemed to be true. That's what she did. Now, she went back to her dream job in the slaughterhouse and she worked hard there and she did love her to be there. She then, in 1984, left David and moved back to her parents' house and rented a little place of her own eventually. She did hurt her back, but this really didn't hold her back because she met another man called David as well, but his name was David Sanders and he was 38. Now David and Catherine moved in together with her little girl and David had a flat of his own. He wasn't really keen on giving it up, so he kept it. This infuriated Catherine. She was controlling, which meant she had no control over what he did at the flat when she went there and she really didn't like it. So what she did was she made sure he understood that she didn't want him to keep this flat. She went outside in the garden, picked up an eight-week-old puppy and slit his throat. She knew David loved dogs and this would break his heart. And it did. It really did break his heart. She then said, this is what happened if you ever cheat on me, and much, much worse. 
She actually knocked David unconscious after this. And in June 1988, they actually went on to have a third daughter and buy a house together. Catherine went on to stab and hit David with an iron. David left Catherine and went into hiding, understandably. Now she tried to find him and she tried pretty hard as well, you could imagine. But all of his friends just wouldn't give him up, would not tell her where he was. Months passed and David tried really hard to stay away from Catherine. But he missed his daughter and that is what brought him back. So he came back, saw Catherine and saw his daughter. She actually said to the police that she was scared of David and a restraining order was issued. This is where their relationship completely ended. And in 1990, Catherine had another baby by a man called John Chillingworth. But this didn't last because actually Catherine decided to cheat on him with a man called John Price. Now, John Price was born in 1955 and he had three children and he was a regular nice man. He was the sort of bloke that you'd see down the pub and have a few drinks with, have a laugh with, and he was just a really nice man. No one said bad words against John. He did like a drink, but he was really hard working. His only downfall was Catherine. She was his complete opposite and he was smitten by her. She did her magic on him like she did on every other man and she wooed him. He loved her. her. His kids actually really liked her. And although he knew about her aggressive side, it didn't matter. They were in love. Now, in 1998, they had a fight and Catherine decided to get back at John by taking a photograph of a first aid box that he had taken from work. Now, bearing in mind, this first aid box was in a rubbish bin and out of date. And he thought it was just a waste sitting there, so he took it home. Catherine thought by taking a photograph and sending it to his boss, he'd get in trouble for stealing. And that's actually what happened. His boss had no choice but to sack him. And John had actually been in this job for about 17 years and never really had any time off at all. So it was pretty harsh just sacking him. Now, they split up for around three months and even though Price did end up forgiving her, he was a bit wary of her. Now, he started to sort of back off a little tiny bit. Their relationship became more and more violent and Price lost most of his friends. He even had to change pubs that he was drinking in because if he was with Catherine, no one wanted to be near him. In 2000, two days before his death, she pulled a knife out on John and stabbed him. He fled the scene, but Catherine actually called the police and got a restraining order out on him. Even though they had a restraining order in place, neither of them actually listened to this restraining order. And they got back together. The one smart thing John did was... He made it clear to friends, colleagues, anyone, anyone, these neighbours, that if his car was in the garden first thing in the morning and he hadn't gone to work, Catherine had killed him. And he kept repeating this to anyone that knew him and made it clear that she was dangerous. John's friends tried to talk him out of going home. Instead, John went to the courts and got his own restraining order out on Catherine but it's said that he was so scared about what she would do to his kids that he gave in and went back. When he got home his kids and Catherine wasn't home. He took some beers and went round his neighbour's house for the evening and he didn't get home till around 11 o'clock. So Catherine was being creative. She was creating her own little scene. So what she did was she went and brought a video recorder and taped herself talking to her grandkids and talking to the camera. This had a timestamp on it. So 
you know. She was creating a scene. When she returned home, she had a shower while John slept. She woke him up, they had sex, and then he went back to sleep. Now, six o'clock came around in the morning the next day, and the neighbours noticed John's car wasn't out of the drive. It was still parked. They remembered what he said, and they become a bit concerned. Now, when John was late for work, the work become concerned because he never had time off. Even though he liked his drink, he turned up for work every day. So they sent someone from work to his house. So the neighbour and a work colleague was outside his house looking to see if they could see anything, what was going on. And what they did see was blood all over the doorway. They called the police and the police arrived about eight o'clock in the morning. The police broke down the door when they saw the pl- when they saw the blood everywhere and they entered the house and they saw what they thought was a blanket hanging up on the doorway. So an officer just reached out his arm and then just pulled it along. Then the officer felt something on his arm. He looked down at his arm and then he realised that there was blood all over his arm. Then he looked up and saw a human pelt just hanging there from meat hooks. They then discovered John Price's body laying there without genitals. But that wasn't all. So Catherine was found in the bedroom, unconscious. She'd taken a cocktail of prescription tablets or drugs, whatever was in her system. Whatever it was, knocked her clean out. So she was out cold on the bed. They actually had to carry her outside. They discovered Price's body like I said, and all the blood splatter on the walls. And what they said was Knight must have stabbed him when he was laying on the bed or asleep. And then this would have woke John up. He would have tried to stumble his way sort of out of the bedroom and try to flick on a light or something because his handprint was on the wall. He then tried to run from the bedroom to the front door, but in the meantime, Catherine was chasing him with a knife and she was stabbing him frequently. This was creating blood splatter everywhere and John bleeding heavily. So John actually made it to the front door, but what happened was he either fell in back in the door or she dragged him because from the state of the blood splatter all around, It was like smudge, so it either looked like he either got to the door, was losing consciousness because of all the blood loss, and fell back in, or he was dragged back in. Either way, he didn't make it out of the door. So John died of bleeding out from the stab wounds, basically on the floor. Catherine Knight cleaned herself up, and she closed the door and changed her clothes. She then reached into John's pocket and grabbed his bank card. While he was laying there dead, she got cleaned up and went into his car, drove all the way to the ATM and withdrew a £1,000 from John's bank. The police never did find this money, but it was proven that she actually left the scene, went into the car and went to the ATM and then came back to the scene. She'd killed him, cleaned herself up and withdrew the body anyway. So John was dead on the floor. Blood was everywhere. Catherine had an idea. She went over to John's body and she skillfully put a incision in his skin and proceeded to skin him. Full pelt. She, she, she was trained in this because this is her job. This is what she did at work. So she moved all of John's skin. She carefully hung her in the doorway by meat hooks, but she wasn't finished. She went on to decapitate John, placing his head in a saucepan of water and boiling it with some vegetables. She removed other parts of his body. They think it was his buttocks. Um, and she sliced him up and cut him and cooked him, and then she served him up with gravy on a plate. Now, Catherine decided to set the table up really nice. So she did this and she put name tags and little notes and she writ a little note to each person. Now, the names on the placemats were John's children. 
but it's never been revealed or I can't find out what was on the back of the placemats. Like it didn't say what she had written. Now she did leave a note covered in blood to John and it read not very well. It read time got you back, Jonathan spelt wrong for rapping mean raping my daughter. You beck for Ross for little John now playing with little John's dick. John Price sick. She clearly didn't finish school. Now, the police carried Catherine out when they arrived at the scene. They carried her out, like I said, because she was just out of it. She just didn't know what she was doing. This gave them a little bit of time by taking her to the hospital that they could compile some evidence against her or what happened at the scene. And they did this. So Catherine was interviewed when she woke up and she said she couldn't remember doing anything. She did say that she had killed John, but she don't remember it. And if she did do it, like she said, it would have only been in self-defense because he was violent towards her. Now at her trial, Catherine pleaded not guilty, but this didn't stick. She did change her plea to guilty and the jury was actually allowed to go home because it was really bad while she was pleading not guilty because the crime scene photos are so bad that I actually can't find any because they've never been released, most of them anyway. There's one I've seen which is just blood on the floor. But all of them have not been released because they were so horif- horrific. Even the police officers had to take time off work and some never came back to work. That scarred them for life going in that house and seeing obviously a human pelt hanging from the wall or doorway, decapitated man, half cut open on the floor and then the rest of him being cooked and then plates of food with him on the plate. It was horrendous a sight as, uh, you know, I guess. So there's no... There's no crime scene photos for us, but the jury actually got a choice not to see them. Some of them pleaded or some of them said that they don't want to see them and some of them did. But the ones that did actually regretted it. And that's when Catherine pleaded guilty. So Catherine was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of ever having parole. This made Catherine the first woman in Australia to be given a full life sentence without ever being able to be free. Now, the case was so horrendous, like I said, the jury just, they they were scarred and the police officers were scarred. But her assessment of her mental health, she was actually sound. So they said that she was completely sane on the time of the murder, although she does have borderline personality, they expect, but she was actually sane when she did it. Now, Catherine refused to accept any of this. And her lawyer actually at the time asked if she could be not present while they read out what happened to John. She didn't want to listen to it, you see. And they said basically get stuffed because she caused all this. Why should she not listen to it when everyone else has got to actually listen to it? She was sentenced on the 8th of November and they were saying that she had no remorse whatsoever. And that's why she was given a full life sentence and never to be released from prison. Now, this crime is horrendous. And I think you'll all agree that Catherine Knight should never, ever be released. And I'm glad she never will. Now, Catherine's about 60 years old now. And the police officers at the scene at the time, 20 years on, said they still suffer with nightmares to this day on what they saw at the crime scene. Now, thank you for subscribing and liking my channel. I do hope you all stick around for the next episode. And that episode is going to be San Francisco Witch Killers. I can't wait to all see you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>